Good morning, everyone. Thank you to the organizer for letting me talk about some of uh, some new work, actually, that we are about to start at Triumph. Uh, the technique, uh, it's called muon spin rotation. So it's not new. The technique has been around for a little while, but what's new is that we have thought of applying this technique for SRF applications, in particular for Q-slope studies. So what, we are gonna, what I'm going to talk about is first uh, I'm going to give a brief overview of how the technique works and then what are my ideas of how we can use this technique for Q-slope studies. This is confusing. <laughs> so. Um, okay, so the technique fits more uh, in the more general uh, category of uh, nuclear magnetic resonance, uh, where you basically use magnetic moment to investigate, to probe local magnetic fields, uh, electronic structure, um, properties of matter. So you have conventional, um, conventional ma uh, magnetic resonance, which we know it's uh, like nuclear magnetic resonance or ESR, where basically the probe is an intrinsic probe. So you use, for example, nuclei or electrons of the materials them itself that you're studying. And then there is unconventional NMR, which is where mu SR, which is the technique I want to talk about, belongs. And in that case, you don't use an intrinsic probe, but you use a, an external implanted probe. And this is muons in the case of uh, mu SR, and it's radioactive nuclei for the case of beta NMR. Both of these facilities are actually at Triumph. Um, I'm going to focus more on MUSR because this is where we're actually starting uh, our studies. But NMR is also a very interesting facility, and I will mention a few words about it, but um, it has, they're both users' facility where you actually have to apply for beam time, and Bet NMR gets three weeks of beam time per year, so it's less accessible, accessible than MUSR. And this is where, basically, MUSR stands on the world map, we have one facility at Triumph, and then there are two in Europe and one in KK. PSI is like Triumph. Um, you basically create the muons. You start from a cyclotron, you accelerate protons to 75% the speed of light, and then you create muons from pi and decay. Um, PSI uh, has a very nice facility, which is uh, actually surface muons, uh, where you can actually implant muons uh, as... Um, shallow, has like a few nanometers. What is the general procedure? The general procedure is in all NMR, you want to produce first a non-equilibrium polarization, and then you want to monitor how this polarization evolves in time, so, or how it changes with frequency, and from that you extract the information on the local magnetic fields or whatever you want to study, the properties of matter. What makes possible. Mu SR is uh, basically that when pi and decays, you know that because of weak interaction, the emerging muon has its spin pointing anti-parallel to its momentum direction. Okay? So that's one thing that makes mu SR possible. Because basically when we, when we take our muon down the beam line to the sample, we know with what momentum it arrives, what is the direction of the momentum. And then the other thing that makes MUSR possible is the asymmetry of the muon decay. So when the muon decays, so at the end of the day, you will use, you will detect positrons, and these positrons that come from the, the, the muon decay, they come with a, an asymmetry, okay? So we know. So this is a schematic to make it a little more understandable. So we have the cyclotron, we accelerate protons, and then from pi on decay, we obtain the muons. The muons are implanted in the sample. And then this is the sample you want to study. And let's say you want to probe local magnetic fields. Basically, the spin will start precessing around the local magnetic field. And then you will look at the Larmor frequency, right? So the frequency is proportional to the local magnetic field you want to detect. And then you look at the positron, at the, the positron which comes from the decay of the muon, and that's how you extract your information on the local magnetic field. So I always find more intuitive, uh, um, actually, the frequency, looking at in frequency. Um, so let's say you start from 
you have an external magnetic field and your superconductor is in the normal state, what you will observe in the frequency domain is a peak, which corresponds exactly to the frequency which corresponds to the external magnetic field you're applying. Then as you go to um, superconducting state, uh, this peak will actually still be there, but it will be lower right? because you basically have the same external field only into a penetration depth, and uh, this will be also spread because you, it will decay over the penetration depth. So you basically look at this frequency spectrum, at the, at the spectrum, and as you force, for example, in the vortex state, so or is if you have flux that starts penetrating, what will happen is that you will start seeing peaks appearing at different frequencies. And that's what carries the information on what local magnetic field you can have. Those are the themes in mu SR. Uh, we're not going to talk about muonium as light hydrogen, but what we are interested in is the fact that it is a very sensitive, so because it's 100% polarized, Basically, it's very sensitive magnetic field probe. And that's what we're interested in. We're going to study, we're going to use it for studying the coexistence of superconductivity and magnetism. We can extract information on magnetic penetration depth and coherence length. And most of all, it's an absolutely direct probe of magnetic field. Okay, this we can go fast, so the, I know that uh, we don't have much time, but it can be implanted into any sample. The polarization is independent from the sample, the sample environment. Um, this is important. We can study magnetism in zero external magnetic field. And also, you can study dynamical ranges which are not accessible with conventional methods. And this is a, a comparison of uh, conventional methods and nuclear beam methods where... It's, it's interesting, for example, to, to look at uh, the difference. You need, uh, for the sensitivity, you need 10 to the 7 versus 10 to the 17 in you know, standard uh, NMR. Okay, so let's go to where we actually are thinking to apply this technique for Q-slope studies. As we said, it is a local. That's, that's one of the things that got me really interested. It is a local an extremely sensitive magnetic field probe. So this could bring more information than just simply simple mag mag magnetization measurements, for example. You can implant a different depth. So your probe can, can be in the first 100 nanometers, can be in the bulk, and can tell you, for example, what is the difference in uh, superconductivity, superconducting parameters, surface versus bulk. Versus bulk. It can be used to study thin film surfaces and multi layer compounds, but this not really the facility we have at Triumph, uh, more like Beta Nemar or the PSI facility um, in Europe. And here are some of the questions that I think you can answer. And I'm going to talk about this. Um, first of all, this is some studies that we, we are just about to start. One question is, is high field slow due to early flux penetration? And I think Miosar can help us answering this question. What is the role of trapped flux on high field Q-slope and or medium field Q-slope? Is there field dependence of penetration depth and coherence length? And how would this affect um, Q-slope? And also, uh, we have heard Tomas talking about magnetic impurities. I think this could be also an interesting tool to check the presence of magnetic impurities. Briefly, early flux penetration, there is... So, I mean, in general, those questions that I'm putting here, some are new ideas, like field dependence of penetration depth and coherence length. Some are old ideas which have been there, but we need, in my opinion, to, if we cannot prove something right, we need at least to try to prove something wrong. So, I feel Q slope due to early flux penetration is something that has been studied. We have, for example, results from Mineni, where it takes samples and it does magnetization measurements, and he observes that field of first penetration uh, changes depending on the treatment and when what 20C bake it goes back up again and this sort of hints to the possibility that there is a correlation and that high field Q slope, the home site of high field Q slope could correspond with the field of first penetration in niobium. 
Also, for example, Alexander Romanenko and Assam Padamsi have studied uh, this possibility and uh, they approached from the um, uh, point of view of looking at the cause. So they think that this location might be sites for early flux penetration and then they look at 120C bake effect uh, and they notice that there is actually a de decrease in this location density which could hint to this. But can we actually prove if it is the right mechanism if field of first penetration corresponds to onset of high field Q slope. So this is what we want to do. We want to try to prove it once and forever. We take high field Q slope limited samples cut out from a cavity or a Cornell cavity. This is a large grain BCP cavity which, was, which had high field Q slope. So this is how it performed. And then it was studied with thermometry and then it was cut in different spots and we have hot spots and we have cold spots. So what we want to do is we want to take this hot spot, we want to take the cold spot, so we know from the RF point of view what the onset is of the high field Q slope. Now, can we correlate this onset with the field of first penetration that we will measure with mu SR? Then another thing that you can think of checking is what is the role of trapped flux on high field Q slope and on medium field Q slope. There is work being done from uh, Alex and Gigi. This is results from a paper on evidence of high field uh, radio frequency hotspots due to trapped vortices. Um, so oscillating fluxoids can cause losses in the medium and in the high field regime. Now, can we somehow verify this with uh, mu SR? Yes, because mu SR can allow to do zero field measurement. So you can take, we will take again this hot spot and cold spot and we will look for a correlation with higher or lower trapped flux, higher or lower capability of trapping flux in one or the other sample. So this is to summarize the description of the experiment, which is, so as I said, you have to apply for beam time and go in front of a committee and make a strong case that it's an interesting experiment and it took us about uh, eight months actually from the moment we apply to obtain 12 shifts and we start now on October 27th. We will measure the field of first penetration in RF characterized via thermometer as I showed, high field Q slope limited samples and compare with high field Q slope RF onset. And we will look at hot versus cold spots, but mostly interesting, we will look at baked versus unbaked. Because as we know, hot and cold at the end of the day, they both show Q slope. But baked versus unbaked, that would be interesting. We will study also the nature of the transition. This is, I think, something that is unanswered, and I think MUSR can, can help answering. What is really the nature of the transition in our cavities? Are we going from a Meissner phase uh, to a mixed state? Or are we passing through an intermediate mixed state? And um, can we think of any correlation between the intermediate mixed state uh, and the hotspots that we see appearing? As I said, we'll study trapped flux with zero field mu SR. This is the field range we're going to look at, temperature range we are going to look at, and those are the sample that they mentioned. So this was the part about uh, proving uh, eventually wrong or right uh, old ideas, and this is maybe some new ideas. Medium field Q slope, high field Q slope. Is it possible that we have a field dependence of fundamental superconducting parameters? So, for example, penetration depth and coherence length. This is actually something that has been observed in many superconductors, yes, unconventional superconductors, and it's determined by the gap structure. So we want to investigate the possibility that there is a double gap in niobium. And we will do this by studying uh, the vortex core size with mu SR. There is actually, I will reference this, this, this paper from Jeff Saunier, which is actually this professor from SFU we collaborate with. Um, on delocalized vortex core states, uh, it's specific heat measurements, which at the end they conclude that from these specific heat measurements that there is a possibility of a double gap in niobium. 